start. Can can you guys hear me okay? Video and uh, slide showing? Hello? Test, test. Okay. Hey, uh, good evening, everyone. It's uh, 6 p.m. Central Time, U.S. Um, later for some of you, I know. Um, so let's get started. Uh, if there's any initial questions uh, about last week's lecture, uh, which I'll go over some of in a little bit, um, I'll be happy to take them now. But tonight, what I would like to concentrate on, I'll catch up on some of the things I, uh, I didn't cover last time and talk about Hoppe's views on types of socialism and the origin of the state. And uh, I don't know if I'll have time to get to desocialization. So, uh, by the way, I posted last week a couple of funny things to the forums about um, uh, Drop It Like a Tapa, a sort of rap thing by a friend of mine, and also a uh, fact about Hoppe, which I thought were amusing. So, hope people enjoyed that. So, let's go on here. So, uh, <clears throat> quick review last class, we talked about um, basically Hoppe's uh, place in the Austrian and liberal sort of. Uh, literature and uh, uh, scheme, his influences, uh, his uh, style, his, uh, his background, his basic orientation. And we talked about basic fundamental property-based and human action-based, praxeology-based foundational concepts and principles which run through most of his work, um, various uh, implications of the human action axiom like conflict and scarcity choice and cost and profit and loss and ends and means and causality and the uh, sort of methodological dualistic approach of Mises, which basically is looking at um, the causal world with the scientific method approach, a more empirical approach, that is uh, positing um, physical laws and then trying to test those laws to see if you can falsify your hypothesis, which is the sort of standard way most people think of science, but the Austrian view is that that's one type of science. Another type of science is the social sciences, which are focused on can, – can anyone hear me, or is it just Rick that's having a problem? Okay, so I'll keep going. Uh, methodological dualism, um, uh, which looks at causal – the causal world in one sense, and which in the case of humans would be human behavior, just analyzing what motions human bodies go through, uh, or trying to understand human ends and means and purposes, <coughs> excuse me, which is the teleological realm. Uh, and from that realm, we know certain things a priori. Um, we know that humans have ends or purposes. They employ means. There's opportunity cost. Um, they have choice. Uh, they, there's a presupposition of causality. If you, if you didn't presuppose causality, you couldn't act. Because action employs means, which are scarce means in the world, which are causally efficacious at achieving your end, or which are believed to be. So an operative presupposition of action would be causality as well. Um, so these are the a priori things that come from the this side of dualism. Uh, then we talked about different property-related concepts like contract, aggression, capitalism, socialism, even the state, which are all defined in terms of this fundamental concept of property. I'm going to go to slide three. So today we're going to continue the discussion of property, um, talk about uh, the, the, how the state arises and what its definition is, um, and then talk about different types of socialism or statism. And if we have time, we'll get to desocialization, which I doubt we will actually, but that, that's okay. We can cover that next time. Um, the readings would be primarily chapters 3, 4, and 5, and to some degree 6 of TSC, Theory of Socialism and Capitalism. Also, uh, Hoppe's article on Banking, Nation States, and International Politics, which is chapter 3 of his EEPP book. And finally, Desocialization in a United Germany, which we may not get to today. Okay, so let me just make one note. I don't know if I made this clear enough last time um, uh, about the concept of property. Um, many of you may have noticed that this, this word is used a little bit carelessly um, by a lot of uh, people, libertarians and others. Uh, it's used um, sometimes to refer to, to the scarce resource itself, like you'll say my car is my property. 
So th they use the word property to refer to the thing that is owned. Um, but technically, it's more of a relationship or a denotation of the ownership right. That's a legally respected right. Now, legally doesn't mean state law. It could be in private law, but basically some kind of institutionalized, uh, legal, uh, legally recognized relationship that is a right to control a given resource. So I think to be careful, we need to think most of the time of property as the, the ownership right in a resource, not the resource that is owned. Uh, and this usage sort of goes back to the traditional usage of the word property, which has been used for hundreds of years uh, in liberal thought and in the classical liberal thought. Uh, Richard Overton uh, in 1646 you know, put it this way, talking about self-ownership. To every individual in nature is given an individual property by nature, not to be invaded or usurped. For everyone as he is himself, so he hath a self-propriety. Else he not be himself. So you see, the propriety is sort of like proprietorship or ownership over yourself. It's not yourself, it's the ownership over yourself. <coughs> and John Locke in 1690 in his second treatise of government, you know, has this classic formulation. Uh, Though the earth and all inferior creatures be so com be common to all men, yet every man has a property in his own person, and nobody has any right to it but himself. So we need to think of property as the relationship between an actor or an agent that is basically a human being and some scarce resource, including his own body, which is also a scarce resource. So property answers the question, who has the right to control this resource? It's not who has the actual control of the resource. Um, actual control can be thought of as mere possession or – so think of Crusoe on a, on a desert island. He would actually have… Um, control of resources that he employs as means in his actions, but he really, really wouldn't have ownership because he wouldn't have any legal right because the legal right is something that other people can respect. So the legal right is more of a social concept, which is compatible, by the way, with Ayn Rand's view of rights as social um, sort of devices. Um, now, there's a, a really good definition. Um, um, by um, A. N. Yiannopoulos. He is one of the uh, world's leading civil law scholars. He's in, in Louisiana. Uh, the civil law is one of the two great legal systems in the world. The common law, which is in England and many of the, the common, former Commonwealth or Commonwealth countries like most of the U.S., most of Canada, um, etc. Uh, and then the other great legal system is that uh, in the continent, so sometimes called the continental system in, in Europe and also in Louisiana in America for historical reasons. And in um, uh, Quebec and Canada and Scotland to a degree, actually, in England, um, that's called the civil law uh, or code-based system. And Yiannopoulos, now he's not a libertarian, but um, it's striking how compatible his analysis is with the Austrian libertarian way of looking at property. As he defines in his uh, treatise, um, which – so I'll show you. This, uh, I love this. This is the West series. It's, it's, um, it's a civil law series from Louisiana property. Fantastic. Very expensive books, but they're they're great. So this is this this book here. Uh, such great works of scholarship. In any case, um, he defines it as I have it on the page here. I won't read the whole thing, but basically I'll read part of it. Property is the exclusive right to control an economic good. Um, it's the concept that refers to the rights and obligations. That have to do with the relations of man with respect to things of value, and he even goes into here about scarcity. He says that um, uh, some things are needed, and because of the demand on them, they become scarce, and then laws help govern the use of these things. And then he says property rights are a direct and immediate authority over a thing. Now, authority is sort of a loaded normative term, which means um, a legally recognized authority or right to control. Um, <clears throat> he has another nice compact expression at the bottom of the page here on page five, slide five. Uh, ownership is um, the fact. I'm sorry, possession. Ownership is the right to control, or you could think of the right to possess. But where mere possession is 
the factual authority that someone has over a thing. So even a thief would have temporary possession over a car he stole, for example, but he wouldn't have the right to control it. He would just have the actual or the factual authority, but not the legally recognized authority. So that's how we need to think of property, and this is how Hans Hoppe thinks about it um, throughout his work. Um, now, let's continue with what we were talking about last time about homesteading. Um, so homesteading, or sometimes called original appropriation, would be assigning ownership. Yeah. Okay. Ethan, would you get that? It's right there behind you. Uh, assigning ownership. Um, Ethan, what's that one? Assigning ownership um, to something that was previously unowned, a scarce resource that was unowned. Hold on a second. Ethan, get out of the room. Okay. Based upon uh, a certain link, an objective link between the owner and the resource. So that is what homesteading is in the Lockean sense, and is sort of reformulated by by Hoppian and Nazesian and Rothbardian terms. Um, now, this intersubjectively ascertainable language is more of a Kantian kind of language. Um, objective is how we would describe it, so he uses those sort of synonyms as you can see here. So um, at, in Hoppe's terminology and Hoppe's con concept conceptual framework, any assignment of ownership to an unowned resource other than by this objective link that is, by mixing your labor or embordering it, would be basically the equivalent of just asserting by verbal decree that you own it. The problem with this is this is just a subjective opinion. It's something anyone can do. Any number of people can do this at the same time, and it doesn't suffice to establish any kind of link that's a unique link between the person claiming the ownership and the property. So it doesn't serve the function of property, which is to assign an owner to this resource so that conflict can be avoided, so that the resource can be used productively um, and peacefully and um, um, as part of an economy and a society. So as Hoppe looks at it is um, to homestead something is to, to embroider. That's what you can think of it as embordering, to produce borderline. So if there's an empty field, you could build a house on it or you know, uh, put a farm on it or put a fence around it. So you put a border up that others can observe in some kind of way. Possessing an apple would be embordering it, showing that you own it and what the limits of your ownership are by the fact of possession, for example. So there are different ways of embordering things or homesteading them um, based upon the nature of the good, the nature of the use to which the human will put it as, as a means to action. Okay, so let's go on here. Now, <clears throat> I mentioned earlier um, um, there are several fundamental concepts, and some of them imply other concepts that are very fundamental as well. Um, scarcity is sometimes used by people in a, in a sloppier way to mean things that are not very common, like not very abundant, like if, um, if um, there's some kind of disease among chickens and so we have fewer eggs being produced, you could say eggs are getting more scarce. But that's more of a colloquial, um, not a rigorous economic concept of scarcity. Scarcity does not mean merely non-abundant. It means that the particular object is a scarce object or what economists call rivalrous. It means there can be rivalry over it. What this means is only one user can use this good at a given time. Um, and if two or more people try to use it, they would have to have physical – conflict over it. So you can actually think of a scarce good as something that is conflictable, something that is possible to have conflict over, something that cannot be used uh, simultaneously by more than one person at the same time as a means of action. Okay, and So you have to think of scarcity meaning this, and this is uh, crucial to Hoppe's entire um, political framework and his economics. Um, in conflict, what it means is physical, violent interaction and strife where two or more actors want to employ the same means or where they're attempting to uh, achieve or use the same end thing, which is basically a means of action. But anyway, it's a scarce resource. Um, so what is conflicting is actions. It's not desires. It's not interests. It's actions that conflict. Actions always employ scarce means, and when it's 
same two two or more actors seek to use the same scarce good at the same time, it's not possible. That is where the conflict is. So for example, um, people often use overly metaphorical or sloppy language, and they'll say something like um, people fight over religion. Um, but technically that's actually not true. People never fight over religion. Re religious differences might be the motivation for the action. It might be the reason why you clash, but what you're clashing over is always necessarily scarce resources, including land or bodies or the uh, property owned by uh, by people, like their money, whatever. Um, you know, so if if, uh, if if one one religious group invades another to convert them to their religion, they're actually physically, you know, using physical you know spears and axes and bows or guns or whatever against the land and property and bodies of the people that disagree with them. There's always a, a clash over scarce resources, whereas the dispute's motivation could be a religious difference, but that's not what the fight is actually over. It's always physical means being used uh, against physical, scarce, material goods. Imagine if everyone in the world were just some kind of intangible ghosts and could pass through each other and couldn't actually affect each other or harm each other. There would be no possibility of conflict or disagreement, and there would be no need for the concept of property. Okay, so again, always keep in mind about the Misesian concept of action as action is something that employs means, which are scarce resources that are causally efficacious at achieving a given end. And again, you can see that by viewing human action this way, all actions imply choice. Now, this doesn't mean that there is actually free will in some kind of ultimate sense. In fact, the question is really irrelevant. Um, if you view another human being and try to understand what they're doing in terms of human action, that is teleologically, that is you under, understand them the way you understand yourself as an actor having choice and values and preferences and goals and employing means to achieve ends. Then you are viewing them as actors, and you are understanding what they do as action and teleologically. You're not viewing them as some kind of uh, deterministic or mechanized cloud of subatomic particles following the four laws of physics. Theoretically, you could, according to Mises and Hoppe. <clears throat> so this is an interesting um, comment here, which um, um, uh, goes into an issue that's very controversial with a lot of people. It goes to religion, it goes to philosophy, it goes to the issue of free will and determinism. Um, and in my view, it's not characterized this way by Hoppe or by Mises, but I believe the right way to characterize what they are saying is a type of compatibilism, which I actually agree with. Um, compatibilism is the view that, in a sense, both determinism and free will are true. Um, and if you have a dualist perspective of human action, I think it helps to explain that because what it means is when you view people as human actors, you're necessarily presupposing and understanding what they're doing as if they have choice. So you can't really say they don't have choice when you're looking at them as actors. If you look at them as you know mechanistic meat robots basically, um, then you're not looking at them as actors. You're looking at their behavior, not their action, and that would be the causal and um, possibly deterministic realm. So Papa says in Economic Science and the Austrian Method, one of his epistemological works, um, no scientific advance could ever alter the fact that one must regard one's knowledge and actions as unpredictable on the basis of constantly operating causes. You might hold this conception of freedom to be an illusion, and one might well be correct from the point of view of a scientist with cognitive power substantially superior to any human intelligence or from the point of view of God. But we're not God, and if our freedom is illusory from his standpoint um, and our actions follow a predictable path, for us this is a necessary and unavoidable illusion. So in other words, it might be an illusion. Hoppe's not really taking a stance, but what he's saying is you cannot help but regard action as being uncaused or as being uh, free, volitional, as free will, um, even if… Our bodies really follow a predetermined path as, as could be seen by some super intelligence outside of our universe um, 
or whatever. He's basically saying that to me this is a type of compatibilism because he's saying it's possible for both to be true. In the causal realm, we might be caused and determined. Therefore, in the teleological realm, we view our actions as being explained um, in the human action framework, which necessarily views our actions as being uh, volitional or making choices. Now, Mises says something similar in human action. Um, we do not assert that man is free in choosing and acting. We merely establish the fact that he chooses and acts. Now, what does he mean by you can choose but it's not free? I think what he's saying is you don't have to take this monistic free will approach and say that we're completely free. Uh, what he's saying is we choose, and choice has a meaning. It means that the human actor evaluates uh, one or more than one possible uh, act he can perform. He makes a choice and thereby demonstrates the one that he um, prefers. Whether it's determined or not is really not necessary to answer. And so Mises goes on. Uh, some philosophers are uh, prepared to expose the notion of man's will as an illusion and self-deception because uh, we must follow the laws of causality. He says something similar to what Hoppe says. They may be right or wrong from the point of view of the prime mover, which is God, uh, or the cause of itself. Uh, but from the human point of view, action is the ultimate thing. We don't assert man is free in choosing and acting. We merely establish the fact that he chooses and acts, and that we're at a loss to use the methods of the natural sciences um, for answering the questions why he acts this way and not otherwise. So they sort of regard human choice as a fundamental that you can't challenge, and whether or not it can be explained or is somehow compatible with the apparent determinism that comes from a scientific view of the causal world, um, he doesn't really care about. It really doesn't matter, and I tend to agree with that as well. Um, now, and at uh, the bottom, I've already gone over the uh, how dualism explains how you can approach things this way. Now, again, the various uh, fundamental concepts of uh, cost, profit, ends, means, and causality are all implied in action. What does that mean? Well, every action is aimed at a certain goal you're trying to accomplish. That's your end. Um, <clears throat> and you're trying to uh, alleviate some kind of uneasiness that you feel or make the world uh, result in a state of affairs that's different than it otherwise would and that you evidently prefer. So if that happens, if you succeed in what you want to happen, then you achieve what, what we call a profit. Now, profit is not always monetary. In general terms, it's psychic profit. That means you know, you're better off now, or at least you're better off – you assume that you will be better off. When you perform the action, that is your ex ante uh, perspective is that it, the action, if successful, if your predictions are right, will make you better off. That's the profit. Now, typically we speak of monetary profit. Now, now that's in a um, an advanced economy having money, in a market economy, uh, or as we say, ca a catalactic economy. Uh, that would be catalactic profit. That's sort of a, a type of or a subset of profit. Um, now. All action has to employ some kind of scarce means, that is, some kind of means that can help you achieve the end you want. So you can see how this way of looking at action, which is really undeniable um, because the act of questioning is an action itself, um, looking at action with this structure helps you see that these other concepts that are packed into it or built into it are themselves also um, undeniable. Now, one word that Mises and Hoppe use sometimes is apodictic, A-P-O-D-I-C-T-I-C, -I -I apodictic or apodictic, which just means basically ineluctable or undeniable. Something that is so fundamental and basic that you presuppose it in the very act of questioning it. So to deny it would be contradictory. Okay, now look, think of it this way. This is an important thing to get, which I mean I don't think I understood this this clearly until a few years ago actually. Because it's never made explicit, but it's very implicit in the work of Hoppe and also in Rothbard and Mises. So you can think of these fundamental concepts working together this way. All has to do with property manipulation and ownership. Homesteading or appropriation is how we create new property titles, and we do that by embroidering. And you could call that a productive act because you're creating something subjectively into the world of commerce and human value that wasn't there before. In a way, before something, when something is unowned, in a way it doesn't really exist. 
is brought into human existence by the act of homesteading. So homesteading is the only way to create a new property title. Contract is the owner of property using his dominion over that thing to transfer the ownership of it. So contract transfers property uh, titles, <clears throat> and we can think of that as a general concept that includes not only exchanges or, um, uh, or, or even unilateral uh, commercial transfers, but um, gifts and you know, bequeaths or bequests upon death by, by will, etc. Basically, it's a transfer of ownership from a current owner to a new owner, however you do it. Now, production transforms owned goods, and we'll get to this in a minute, but a really important thing to recognize here, and this comes into the intellectual property debate. It creates wealth and value, but it doesn't create property. Okay? So production means you own something and you work on it using your intellect, using your ideas about causality, using your ideas about what ends are possible, what things you can do with it, using your information and ideas about what uh, – possible means you can employ to change this or what shapes you can rearrange it into. Basically, you, re you rearrange it into a more valuable configuration. So these are the fundamental uh, property um, concepts, homesteading, contracts, and production. Okay. So the way Hoffa looks at it and the way I agree is the proper way is to view property rights. First of all, human rights the, or the only proper, the only human rights are property rights, or put it this way, all human rights are property rights because rights are always about who owns what, who gets to do what, and that's only a question that pertains to scarce uh, goods because anything else can't be conflicted over, and there's no, there's no social problem to solve there. Um, there's no need for a rule. There's no need for a norm. There's no need for a right. There's no need for a law. It makes no sense. So all human rights are property rights. And property rights are necessarily only in scarce resources. This is why information is not ownable, and this is why we have to be careful. I've already mentioned a few times how there's a certain sloppiness, Ethan. There's a certain sloppiness um, with concepts and words, which is okay usually, but you have to be careful not to let it lead you to equivocation on accident or to overuse of metaphors. Um, so, for example, Rothbard explains that all rights are property rights, and that things we talk about like the freedom of speech, freedom of uh, the press are not really independent rights. They're just consequences of property rights. Okay, So as you can see from the previous um, uh, breakdown on page 11 – let me go back – from homesteading, contract, and production that – back on page 12 now uh, – that creation is not an independent source of ownership. Uh, and, and this is a common view even among Rand who contradicted this somewhat when she talked about intellectual property, but Mises, Rothbard, and Hoppe, and even Rand were explicit about this. What, what they view is wealth is created by rearranging already owned factors of production or scarce resources. I have a blog post that discusses this in detail, which I have a link for here on this page, um, and I'll quote some of it on the following pages. Um, so let's take Hoppe first um, because he's the subject of the course, even though he came later than the others, I'll quote. Um, Hoppe writes, one can acquire and increase wealth either through homesteading, production, and con contractual exchange, or by expropriating and exploiting homesteaders, producers, and contractual exchangers. Now, what he's doing there is dis distinguishing between peaceful and violent ways of acquiring wealth. But what I want to focus on here is the first half of that sentence. You can increase wealth. By homesteading, now that's true. If you if you uh, if you acquire a, or an unknown resource and make it your own, now you have something that's valuable to you that you didn't have before. If you if you have a contractual exchange, by definition, both parties to an exchange, you know, let's say two people exchange a chicken for a pig, you know, each one demonstrates by his actions that he values the thing he receives more than the thing he gave up. It's actually not what class what, what what conventional economists would say is that you know it's an even exchange that uh, that the value of the pig is equal to the value of the chicken. It's actually not true. The guy that receives the chicken values that chicken more than the pig he gave up. The guy that receives the pig the pig receives the pig more than the chicken he gave up to acquire it. So each one is better off after the exchange. 
um, which is why every contractual exchange actually increases the sum total of wealth in society, not by a cardinal number, not that you can measure utility, but you know that both parties uh, are better off after. Um, Lucas says this screws up the model, so don't say this. Yeah, you're right. And in fact, uh, th this is a presupposition of, of like you know, income tax law. Um, you know, the way it operates, they quite often will tax you for the value, the value they say of something by its monetary value. But this is actually unscientific because you know, if I pay ten thousand dollars for a car, or someone gives me a car that someone else would pay ten thousand for, and the IRS would tax me. On ten thousand dollars worth of value, well, actually, the car may be worth more than ten thousand to me because I paid ten thousand for it, so I value the car more than the ten thousand. So you can see that these um, the state actually requires unscientific economic principles. Okay, but now I left out production. So production by production, Hoppe means um, rearranging something you already own to make it more valuable. That is that is an increase in wealth. Okay, so. Um, let's, let me go on to the next page and uh, let you see what um, Rothbard and others said about it. So even Ayn Rand wrote this. This is a fascinating quote, um, which I don't think she quite realized the implications of it when it comes to uh, patents and copyrights or intellectual property, which she supported. She, she acknowledges here very powerfully um, the power to rearrange the combinations of the natural elements is the only creative power man possesses. Um, Creation does not mean the power to bring something into existence out of nothing. Creation means the power to bring into existence an arrangement of natural elements that hadn't existed before. So you can see what this implies is you own some property, and then you rearrange it to make it more valuable. You know, Apple takes plastic and metal and um, <coughs> excuse me, um, silicon and turns it into an iPod. If you put it into the blender and see if it will blend, then you turn it back into a useless uh, hunk of matter, but you have to own this matter to rearrange it into something more valuable. Now, the Randians will say you're creating values, and therefore you own these values, but of course you can see this as double counting or it's unnecessary. You don't need to say you own the value that you create. You don't need to own the product that you create to own the iPod that you fashion because you had to own the raw factors first. That went into it, and you own them because you already own the property that goes into it. Rothbard says something similar. Um, man finds himself in a certain situation, and you decide to change the situation to achieve your ends, but you can only work with the numerous elements that he finds in his environment by rearranging them to bring about the satisfaction of his ends. Now, uh, some of the objectivists and Randians have accused Rothbard of plagiarizing from Rand because he used to be in her orbit. Um, but um, let me show you what Mises said earlier than both of them um, about the nature of production. He says there's a naive view that regards it as bringing into being of matter that didn't exist before as creation. But then he says this is inadequate. The role played by man consists solely of combining his personal forces with those of nature um, so that your cooperation leads to a particular desired arrangement of material. No human act of production leaves amounts to more than altering the position of things in space and leaving the rest to nature. And that part means relying upon causal laws that will uh, get you what you want. But basically, he's, they're all talking about the same thing. Okay. Now, let's switch to um, the, the origin of the state, the nature of the state, and then we can talk about different types of, um, of socialism. So this is Hoppe, a quote from Hoppe. Let me begin with the definition of a state. Now, this is one characteristic of Hans uh, Hoppe, which I uh, have always admired, is his ability to have very clear, concise, and essentialist definitions. Um, he doesn't leave a lot of things to implication like a lot of writers do, uh, and making it explicit um, you know, helps to clarify just what you're arguing. And you'll see this also in Rothbard. Rothbard is a very clear writer. You can understand what he's saying. If you try to read a lot of um, political theorists of other schools, even the Hayekian schools sometimes, but especially the leftists and the Marxists and others, um, they are awful very vague and slippery, and they change definitions from minute to minute. Uh, so this is an admirable quality. So his definition of the state is really good here. Um, 
What must an agent be able to do to qualify the state? He must be able to insist that all conflicts – now remember, this goes back to his view of conflict as conflict over the use of a conflictable or rivalrous or scarce means. Um, all conflicts among the inhabitants in a given territory must be brought to him for ultimate decision-making for his final review. In particular, this agent um, must be able to insist that all conflicts involving himself – be adjudicated by him or his agent. Now, implied in this power to exclude from all others from acting as ultimate judge as the second defining characteristic of the state is the agent's power to tax, that is to unilaterally determine the price that justice seekers must pay for his services. Now, you can see that this actually applies to any state, even a minarchy. Um, and Ahan says in other places, uh, he, he, he combines the power to tax. With the power to have a monopolistic decision making uh, power in a given territory. And these are actually sort of both sides of the same coin. And in fact, either one is sufficient for the other. Imagine an agency that didn't have a monopolistic uh, right to outlaw competition in adjudication services, but it had the power to tax. Well, if it has the power to tax, then it can outcompete um, all other agencies. Um, because it can uh, take money from the people and uh, use it to subsidize its services, uh, similar to the way that public or, or state schools, government schools in, in say, the U.S. Um, are hard for private schools to compete with, and why, it's why private schools are a minority. Uh, conversely, if you didn't have the power to tax but you had the power to outlaw competition, then the agency could simply uh, charge an, a monopoly price for its services, which people will be forced to use. Because you're preventing them from using uh, competing services, so that's the same as a tax. So basically, taxing implies monopoly, and monopoly implies taxes. Um, Edward asks, "What about the mafia and the black market arbitration that escapes the state's jurisdiction?" Um, I'm not sure what what your question is about it. Uh, if you want to elaborate, you can. But I would, I, would, and I would say the state doesn't have to have 100% complete control to exist. That's obvious. Even now, there's a black market. But the state just have, has to have enough to survive and prosper um, and stay around. You know, one difference between um, – no, nothing is perfect. It's just uh, sufficient to, uh, to be an institution that can survive. Um, the, um, the mafia is very similar to the state. The main difference is it's not seen as legitimate. In fact, that's – the primary difference. It's not seen as legitimate uh, by the people that it persecutes. Uh, it also basically taxes people um, and outlaws competition, violence to some degree, um, <clears throat> but it's not seen as legitimate, so it's always um, um, the extent to what it can get away with before people start fighting back is more limited. The state uh, dilutes people in the thinking primarily by democracy and the right to vote. And by employing them, and giving them benefits, uh, makes people. Yeah, I think actually, Jock says the state is like Stockholm, so Stockholm syndrome. I actually think that's a good analogy to explain um, the mentality of people that believe the state is legitimate. They are basically victimized by the state, but they believe the state's lies that um, they need the state to survive and to have a good society. Uh, Lucas mentions private arbitration. Um, yeah, but private arbitration that's open and um, you know legal operates under the sort of umbrella of state um, control and only with the state's permission. Uh, in fact, if you have an arbitration and there's a determination, you have your arbitral award and you want to enforce it. You know, if the um, if the loser refuses to comply, then you what you have to do is actually take that to a state court for ultimate enforcement. And the state actually will not enforce arbitral awards that uh, it deems to be contrary to public policy. That is, uh, if you try to escape, like you know, let's say you had a uh, you made your employee sign an arbitration agreement, um, the rules of which are the rules of the arbitration agreement or, or the agency that you agree to hear it, um, don't permit uh, the employees to argue um, based upon environmental protection laws or human rights protection laws or minimum wage or pro-union legislation, well, then the, the, the state's courts simply wouldn't enforce that. Um, so it's all basically uh, puppets of the state or, or, or operating under the state's uh, wing or control. So 
so the, the conclusion to this, con this quote by Hoppe, <coughs> excuse me, based on this definition of the state, it is easy to understand why a desire to control a state might exist. For whoever is the monopolist of final arbitration within a given territory can make laws, and whoever can legislate can tax. This is an enviable position, and I have a couple of links here. I have a link to Hoppe's article, which this quote comes from, and this thinking runs through a lot of his, uh, his work, uh, and also a blog post by me, which quotes this and elaborates on it a little bit. Okay, now, how does the state arise? Uh, that is something that's different than a mafia that, that can only get away with so much. So Hans has a fantastic article, which um, which is now a chapter in the expanded edition of his um, Economics and Ethics of Private Property, Chapter 3, Banking, uh, Nation States, and International Politics. Well, he, I can't go into that whole article here, but um, the, the fundamental thing to get from it for, per, for this purpose here is he goes into a systematic analysis of exactly how the state sort of insidiously takes control of certain institutional features of society to slowly have its tentacles in everything and to basically uh, take control. So as, as he argues, the state takes over and corrupts many um, institutions and aspects of life, such as uh, roads and transportation. Right? I mean all roads in society are primarily state-owned. Um, which leads, by the way, in Hans's view, uh, which we'll discuss in another lecture, uh, to forced integration. Because, for example, the roads the government puts up are free to use, uh, makes it easy for citizen A to travel across the country, and the state has any discrimination laws so that if the road takes you to a neighborhood that could be private and might have a restriction against uh, people that are culturally different or whatever. Now they can't enforce this, and so it's easy for people to get there. So it's a, it's a way of the state forcing integration on people, which has implications for Hoppe's immigration views. Um, uh, communications. Um, you know, as soon as the uh, radio waves started being privatized in the courts, um, in the common law, in the early part of the 19, I guess 1900s, um, was it 20? Sorry, uh, yeah, 1900s. Uh, the um, the FCC was created and basically appropriated and monopolized it. I'm talking about the U.S. here, uh, and now they're trying, of course, to regulate the internet and communication because communications is a and of course there's extreme censorship and more authoritarian regimes. Uh, what people are permitted to read, what can be what people are permitted to say, who are permitted to talk to, you, freedom of the press, freedom of speech. Uh, of course, law and justice, the courts, the police, um, healthcare now. Uh, money is another extremely important one. The government takes over money. Well, these are all private institutions and functional features that would arise if the state insidiously starts taking over. Um, the financial and banking sector, of course, and money. Uh, and education, another extremely important one. That's explicitly for propagandistic purposes. So when the government takes over so many things like this, it starts getting its hooks into the entire um, um, fabric of society. And then finally, a big one, slide 19 now, would be democracy itself. Uh, so we have a system of state education which makes people sort of believe the myths of democracy and you know, we are the state. Um, and then the state redistributes state power itself, gives everyone, like, makes everyone a shareholder in the state in a sense, uh, a stakeholder in the state. You know, My mom might be getting Social Security payments. Someone else might be on welfare. Someone else might have a job. Um, you know, at the local prison, someone else um, may be manufacturing um, uh, munitions that uh, in the defense industry that the, that the army, the military buys. Uh, someone else may be going to a subsidized school or college. Uh, and so everyone starts thinking of themselves as part of the state and dependent on the state and beneficiaries of the state, and they have a stake in, 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 in by their voting and by their lobbying to um, – uh, to try to use the state to take from others to get for themselves, um, and that helps reduce resistance to state power. So when people view themselves as owners of the state or we are the state, uh, when you can vote and you're, you believe the myth that your vote matters and you control things, uh, when you're dependent on the state for your survival, um, you, then you're not going to resist state um, expansion of power as much as you would if it was, say, a monarch. A monarchy or even a despot or a mafia, 
where the distinction between the ruler and the ruled is clear, and the fact of the um, the um, of the violence and the basically the theft that this ruler is committing is visible and evident. Um, and you might put up with a king as long as he provides some benefits to you. You know, he's kind of kind of harsh. He taxes you. You grudgingly pay it, but at least he sort of helps keep foreign armies away and does some kind of justice. So the role of these isolated states, uh, state actors, would be clearer, but not in the modern democratic state. Um, anyway, in the point of this article, um, this chapter is to talk primarily about money and banking. So that's why he concludes that you know, with the monopolization of law and security production, traffic. Communication and education. Oh, by the way, the T we can mention the TSA here, of course, and uh, airplane traffic and uh, transportation. Excuse me, which the government regulates, um, as well as the democratization of state rule. All features of the modern state have been identified, but one: the monopolization of money and banking. And then he goes in to talk about that. And of course, you can see how how uh, horrible that is as well with our current recession and uh, economic cycle, etc., which the state creates. And then the state comes in and rides into the rescue or uses this as an excuse um, to seize more power in emergency level or to print literally trillions of dollars of money uh, and to hand it over to cronies of the state like Goldman Sachs, et cetera, um, the GM, the airline industry. Um, and everyone just puts up with it because they believe the state lies that – the state can protect us from this horrible disaster, which the state itself, of course, has caused. Um, Tito has a question. Well, actually, you don't have a question. Okay, here it is. <clears throat> Tito says, given Hobbes' definition of the state, will we then presume that rather than uh, government per se, the state is more precisely a form of government? We can't accurately suggest that monarchy is a monopolistic expropriator by its nature, and neither is democracy, both are governments. Uh, the state is by its nature a monopolistic expropriator. Well, okay, my view of this, and I think it's compatible with, with Hoppe's views. Um, um, the word government, of course, is widely used by libertarians and others, again in a sloppy fashion, sometimes as a synonym for the state, uh, and sometimes um, not as a synonym for the state. Um, um, Hans tends to use the word state, which I believe is more precise. Um, I would tend to think that the word government means – the best meaning of the word government is some kind of institutions of justice and law in a given society, um, whether that's a state government or whether it's a private government. So I would agree with you that in a way a state is a type of government. It's just a, it's a bad type of government. So I would, I would agree with you on that, but that's why we talk about the state um, because that's a more clear definition. And by the way, you may notice this too. So that when the state takes all these uh, – has all this control over our institutions, they gradually infiltrate our language and our concepts with this – what I call classificationism. Basically, everything comes down to a state arbitrary classification. You know, Like they'll say, is that a marriage or is it not a marriage? And if it is, then certain rules apply, certain don't. I mean there's, there's millions of um, – hundreds of these things of what an employee is. What, if you're not an employee, then you're not subject to certain rules. What money is, what you know, what it means to be practicing law or practicing medicine, what income is, um, you know, what interstate commerce means, etc. I have a blog post on this as well, which you can click on there. <clears throat> and Papa's view is the state is fundamentally based on a mistake by the populace. Uh, that is, it rests upon societal consent because it's always a small group of uh, parasitically leeching off. The society at large, so it, it, it could not survive. It doesn't have enough physical might to survive uh, if every if 90 percent of society saw it as a mafia. It couldn't get away with what it gets away with. Um, so it's the only reason that it exists is because people are, have a mistaken notion about its legitimacy, and this is because of ideological propaganda, which again it helps. It's accomplished because of its control over media, uh, communication, and especially education. Uh, and because of e widespread economic illiteracy of the, of the people, most people I believe are decent, and if they really understood the economic consequences of the law that they support, they would be much less willing to support um, statist and socialist policies. And also because 
of the problem of vested versus diffuse interest. That is, special interest groups you know, are motivated to lobby Congress, for example, to pass laws that help them, and it only affects you know, everyone else in society a small amount. They don't have an organized interest in countering it. In this way, we get to a point of uh, warring special interest groups and in basically a system like we have now where everyone is trying to get theirs at the expense of everyone else. Uh, by the way, I'm not much of a conspiracy theorist myself. I think Hoppe is more um, sympathetic to them than I am, and Rothbard was far more sympathetic. Uh, but he does have a good point here, Rothbard does, about – and this goes back to the state ideology point. He says that you know, the state tries to uh, poo-poo the idea of conspiracies, um, uh, and, and the idea – look at the bottom of the score here – is that… A conspiracy theory could unsettle the system by causing the public to doubt the state's ideological propaganda. So he's like he's saying that conspiracy theories are useful because they help people to distrust the state. And I think there's something to that, but that doesn't mean that they're all correct. Now, back to Hoppe's essentialist definition of socialism. Remember, he defined it as Socialism has to be conceptualized as an institutionalized interference with or aggression against private property and private property claims. Now, you'll notice here that the standard definition of socialism talks about um, um, state control or collective control of the means of production. But Hoppe looks at that as just one – he generalizes beyond that and says, look, there's nothing special normatively or politically about means of production. It's just one type of useful property. Uh, but there's lots of types of useful property. Um, they all serve as means to – means that uh, part of action, scarce goods, scarce means of the part of action. And so – and he also – the word institutionalized distinguishes it from private crime. Now, he's, of course, a libertarian opposed to private crime, used that as aggression, but it's just private aggression, not institutionalized. Institutionalized would have to be uh, some kind of regular, systematic, repeated… Sustained interference or aggression committed by an institution, an agency society that is seen as legitimate and therefore can impose these as laws on people. And capitalism, uh, correspondingly, is defined as a social system based on explicit recognition of private property um, and a contractual, non aggressive exchange between private property owners. So he defines it this way. And um, some people have objected to this because they want to maintain the word socialism to refer to basically communism or, or state control of the means of production. But Hoppe's essentialist definition allows him to sort of see common threads um, in things that are less than full-fledged or outright socialism or communism and see the common threads between them. Um, and basically this goes back to his definition of the state. Um, Basically, in Hoppe's terminology, the state, any state, even a minarchy, is necessarily, and to the, to the extent that it exists, is socialistic because even a minarchy has to commit some kind of systematic aggression, which is socialistic. And conversely, um, socialism is necessarily a state. Um, so he, he basically looks at them, and that, that allows him to look at it as a spectrum, different types, blends, flavors of socialism, types of states, that is. Um, which have different effects on society because they're different types of states, different types of socialism. So this is why he says um, <coughs> um, uh, there must exist varying de types and degrees of socialism and capitalism, that is, varying degrees to which property, private property rights are respected or ignored. Societies are not simply capitalist or socialist. Indeed, all existing societies are socialist. Some extent. Now, he doesn't mean here that all societies have to be socialist to some extent. What he means is in today's world, because everywhere that there's society, there's a state, then there's socialism. And he breaks it down into different types, and I'm only going to touch on some of his um, key analyses and features of these because once you start reading into this, you get the hang of it. I mean, he basically breaks it down into socialism Russian style, which most people would call socialism or communism. Socialism, social democratic style, the socialism of conservatism, and the socialism of social engineering. These are, excuse me, uh, chapters three, four, 
three, four, five, and six of TFC. So why don't we do this? Let's talk. Let's let's uh, continue on for another a few more minutes um, before we have Q and A um, or before we have a break and go into some of these so that we can get close to finishing uh, today. So first he talks about socialism Russia style. Now there's not too much surprising here. It's just that his framework allows him to first analyze the most um, pristine or you know, paradigmatic type of socialism and analyze its effects. A lot of these are common to libertarian and, and Austrian critics of socialism. Um, but basically he first talks in the book around page 28 about how if you have any type of institutionalized socialism, that is redistribution of property rights, right, um, then this is going to have bad effects on society. Um, even in the Garden of Eden, it would reduce and it would result in reduced investment and also in non-productive personality types. Basically, people would become more aggressive, uh, and that's because aggression will become more, prof more profitable. And non-aggression is not as legally respected, and you can't profit from it as much. So he said even in the Garden of Eden. But now in this chapter he's talking about uh, what he talks – what most people call socialism par excellence. That is the kind of standard thing they think of as socialism, a Marxist sort of social system for the means of production, which means the scarce resources used to produce consumption goods um, are nationalized or socialized. That is controlled collectively instead of being owned privately uh, by private property owners like capitalists. Um, and you notice here that he's talking here about um, the means of production is a type of scarce resource or scarce good. It's a means of action, but it's a subset of all scarce resources. It's the subset that is used to produce consumption goods, which are another scarce resource or scarce good. Um, now, Hans' essentialist definition, he would include both of those, um, the, the systematic aggression against both of those as a type of socialism. But here we're talking socialism par excellence or Russian style. Um, so just a typical type of socialism most people think about. The type that um, the, the Democrats uh, will laugh when they say uh, it's ridiculous to call um, Obamacare you know, socialized medicine. It's ridiculous to call that socialism. Um, now, in one sense, they're correct that it's not really the state control of the means of production. Um, but it does amount to an institutionalized interference with private property rights, you know, the taxes needed to pay for it, and regulations that tell people what to do, or doctors, etc. Um, so it would have similar effects to um, at least similar negative effects to standard socialism. Anyway, Hoppe in this chapter analyzes many aspects of communism or this Russian style socialism. So, he, for example, he looks at the economic effects, and he breaks it down into three primary effects, and one would be there would be a relative drop in the rate of investment and the rate of capital formation. And the reason is when you socialize goods, you favor the non-user, the non-producer, and the non-contractors of the means of production. So um, you, know, you, you basically get what you subsidize, and this raises costs for users, producers, and contractors, so there's fewer people acting in those roles. Um, that means there's going to be less original appropriation of natural resources, less production and upkeep of the old factors, and less contracting. And these are the ways that wealth is generated, remember. So there's less wealth. Now, this is true. This first uh, effect, he notes, is true of all types of socialism. Um, even, even in a minarchy, you're going to have this effect to some degree, maybe not as extreme or, or severe, but the same effect. Now, a second effect is… Um, it's going to result in a wasteful use of the means. Okay, so that's also a way of destroying wealth because when you use uh, pro property for its not for its most desired end, then you have less wealth being produced. Um, uh, to keep to stay on track, let's skip over this. You can, if you read these chapters, you'll see he goes into a lot of detail about the intricate um, analysis of the different ways these different types of socialism uh, affect society. Um, so then number three, it uh, causes relative impoverishment, a general drop in the standard of living by, by overutilizing the factors of production. And the reason is if you're a caretaker of property, then you have a different incentive to maintain it and use it effectively 
than a private owner would. This is sort of a uh, tragedy of the commons to an extent, uh, just a traditional incentive problem of socialism. He also mentions lastly that uh, <clears throat> socialism, Russian style, has important changes in the character structure of society, um, changes people's personality over time, and this is true. Um, makes people less alert to opportunities for profit, less productive. They don't care as much about anticipating changes in consumer demand because they can't do anything about it uh, or they can't profit from it as much. Um, they don't develop as many market strategies. So people's initiative declines, their work habits decline. Um, and then if, if the state has to reintroduce a little bit of capitalism because they're just going – they're becoming impoverished, uh, it's too late. To get the people to change, you've already ruined the whole character of a of a of a society. Um, and in this chapter, um, um, let's, let's go on. The, the, let's go on to this. Uh, the next one. Um, socialism, social, social democratic style. So, as Hoppe argues, even if you have a moderate market socialism. Uh, you still can't prevent a relative impoverishment of the population if there's socialized production to any extent. Um, so what he, you know, what he explains is that you know the failures of communism were too apparent and it was too unpopular. So a lot of these countries, even though they had the same egalitarian and anti-capitalist impulses, didn't want to put you know, central planning in place, so they put a softer version, which is social democratic style. Um, and one, you know, there are two central features. Um, so unlike Marxist socialism, private ownership and the means of production is not outlawed. It's permitted, except with some exceptions, right? Uh, except for education, traffic and communication, central banking, and the police and the courts. And remember, in top of the banking and nation states piece we just went over, these are important ways the state gets its tentacles and control over society. And the second thing is the owners of the means of production only own part of their income that they can acquire from using these means of production, and then part of it goes to the state, like in the form of taxes or some other kind of uh, controls. And of course, this is going to have systematic effects too, um, similar to but not the same as, but similar to Russian style socialism. There will be less production, more impoverishment, um, less wealth formation. More leisure, people will value leisure more because its uh, uh, productivity is relatively less rewarding, so they're more lazier, more spend more time le in leisure. Um, and then people also shift their activities to less productive activities or gray market or black market activities or things that are not taxed or taxed relatively less. Um, so it distorts the structure of society that way as well. Okay, now this. A really interesting shift is when most people would recognize that uh, social democracy is sort of a soft type of socialism, even though it's not outright central control of the means of production. But Hoppe, of course, shows that using the essentialist definition of aggression and statism <coughs> that he has, that of course every state is socialist to some degree, um, and cons conservative policies and conservative type of governments and regimes. Also, or socialistic, but in a different way. So he starts out here with a fascinating overview of, of the history of feudalism, which, by the way, is compatible with um, the left libertarian um, and mutualist type criticism that is common nowadays of existing property structures that came from feudalism or state favoritism in the past. Um, I mentioned, I don't know if I mentioned earlier in another lecture, um, that Hoppe's uh, views on um, Homesteading of easements um, is also compatible with the sort of left libertarian criticism. You know, his idea that uh, if you have people in a community and they they're, they're traveling to the river, but they haven't really homesteaded the land, they might have homesteaded an easement the right of way over the land. And if someone then homesteads that land, they homestead it subject to the easement the right of way. Um, this is similar to some of the complaints a lot of left libertarians have. Um, and the fact that this is built into Hoppe's work shows, I think, that um, that some of their concerns are already addressed by uh, anarcho-capitalists like Hoppe. Um, uh, so, it, for example, here he talked about, you know, 
the assignment of property rights to these feudal lords when they started acquiring all this property didn't come from actual appropriation or contract. They just were, were given a special privilege by the state or by the by the system, um, um, and then that allowed them, of course, to collect rents from the serfs and have extra market power and to develop these you know feudal feudal kingdoms and. Uh, and this is a type of socialism as well because it's it's an institutionalized interference with private property rights. Whose rights would it be interfering with? It would be interfering with the rights of the people that were actually using the property, for example, the serfs, basically taking their property rights from them. And of course, this is a different type of socialism than Russian style or even social democratic style, but it's also going to have negative effects. Um, Hoppe calls this aristocratic socialism. <clears throat> now, this is perfectly compatible with his other writings, which we'll get to in another lecture, um, about the relative superiority of uh, some kind of constitutional monarchy, traditional monarchy. It doesn't mean he's a monarchist. In fact, he's not, and it doesn't mean that to the extent these monarchies are feudalistic like this that they don't have problems as well. They do, um, but you can still say one type of state is institutionally inferior or superior in different ways than other types. And as Hoppe notes, these conservative uh, uh, states tend to use price controls, regulations, and behavior controls, which are socialistic in Hoppe's framework because um, because they interfere with people's use of their property or their bodies, which is a type of property. Finally, um, I'll pause here and we'll take a break, but. He also has a long chapter. We won't get into this too much because a lot of it has to do with his, um, his build up to his methodology and his attack on positivism. But he's talking here about in America and pragmatic practical societies, which are not really that principal thinking, but use a lot of the methods of the natural sciences and a lot of empiricism, um, influence from Karl Popper, where we have more piecemeal social engineering. Um, which, by the way, is becoming more systematized. But you know, one policy here, Social Security, for example, um, how these, of course, have similar effects to the socialist policies um, of the other types, but different. So why don't we take a break here at seven past the hour? Let's come back um, at uh, five and at fifteen past the hour, and we will resume with a few more, uh, a few more uh, slides and then some Q and A. So I'll be back uh, shortly. See you at fifteen past. This question about Hoppe's arguing that um, government or really the state is not necessary for law and justice enforcement. Yeah, he makes it explicitly in um, several places. I think it's, uh, it's in his book, um, The Myth of National Defense, or something like that. Um, he's got a chapter or two in there on that. And he's got one or two other pamphlets or articles about this, and I'm going to cover that in a subsequent lecture. Um, to try his book, The Myth of National Defense. Um, Let me go through a few more of my slides here. Uh, actually, okay, so no, I, I've actually kind of finished what I wanted to go over here. Um, uh, he's got a, a nice article which I'll cover briefly at the next lecture um, on desocialization in the United Germany. He also has an extended sort of discussion in um, in the previous chapters we just discussed, uh, comparing East Germany and um, West Germany. Um, is showing how you know the difference between those two is striking. It's a great laboratory case showing the um, uh, how sort of this example bears out some of his predictions about uh, economic predictions about um, how socialism can affect a society culturally, personality-wise, uh, spiritually, um, uh, politically, and of course um, in various economic ways. Um, now, what he does, you'll note that you know Hans is an apriorist. That is, um, he's an Austrian in the Milesian tradition who believes in the um, the use of deductive laws. That is, a priori laws. <clears throat> what Mises does and what Hoppe does is they they take a starting point certain undeniable propositions, like for example the action axiom or the uh, the, the a priori. Of, of, of action, and they 
they deduce certain facts from this that cannot be denied. And then they introduce certain contingent facts um, to make the analysis more tailored to what we have and more interesting, but these introdu introduced facts are usually a little bit less um, controversial. Uh, they're not controversial at all. For example, um, the assumption is made that we don't have a barter economy, that we have a catalactic commercial roughly free market economy with money. And if you assume that there's money, then you can make other deductions based upon your basic fundamental economic laws. Um, and that, that hold as long as the assumptions are true, that is as long as there is money. Um, so this is a common technique of Mises and Hoppe. Um, and so what he does in his uh, chapters analyzing the effects of socialism is he says, listen, I'm deducing all these effects, systematic effects, by basically pure reason, by deductive reason. Now, he can't say what the extent of the effects are. He can say, you know, if you diminish property rights in this following way, then you can expect to see these types of consequences. There's a tendency. He can't say what the extent or magnitude is. Um, and what um, uh, what Austrians believe is that you, you don't really um, – you can't test or verify a priori laws, but you can illustrate them. With historical examples, so that's what Hans is doing with the Germany and East Germany, West Germany uh, analysis. He's saying that look, my preceding analysis is, is stands on its own as a deductive exercise with certain uh, empirical assumptions, but let's take a look at the West Germany, East Germany case to illustrate it, not to test it really, but just to illustrate it and to get an idea of the magnitude of some of these these tendencies. Um, so. He also has, a, like I say, we'll talk in detail next time, and let me let me explain what we're going to talk about in the next. We'll talk about the desocialization. In the next class, we're going to switch to ethics in Hoppe's case about libertarian rights and argumentation ethics. Uh, we may get into a little bit of <coughs> uh, more political matters as well. Um, so that's the reading assignment. I'll post it on the course page uh, later today. So we have plenty of time. There were some questions which I didn't get to earlier. Because um, I wasn't, I didn't stop at all those. So if I've missed any that you want to repeat here or refer me to, or if you have any other questions, I'd be happy to uh, discuss anything. Or if anyone wants to discuss anything, uh, go for it. Tina Warren asked, uh, "What are my thoughts on geo-libertarianism?" And I assume you mean Georgism. Um, I think um, um, I think it's unlibertarian. I think it's uh, based upon bad economics, uh, kind of crankish views on value, and uh, that Austrians uh, disagree with. Um, the idea of a single tax is insane, I believe. I mean, basically, it's, it's a type of socialism because it's it's a type of institutionalized interference with private property rights. That is the right to uh, land. Um, now, it probably would be better than what we have now if that's all you had, but it would, of course, metastasize and turn into a worse um, uh, a tyrannical state like we have now. Um, so I don't think it's it's very sound. I don't think it makes any sense. I think it has a fixation on with on land, with land as some kind of special type of good, but I don't I don't think there's any economic case for that. I think land. Um, now, I don't know if Hoppe has written much on Georgism. I know Rothbard did. Rothbard demolished Georgism in some of his articles. Um, um, but anyway, the idea of tax is a bad idea, and the idea that um, you don't own the, the you know, the, 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 the productive or the rent comes from land because you didn't create the land, you only you only improved on it or something like that. I think it's nuts. Um, the libertarian idea is simply always to answer the question, who has the right to control this scarce resource? And the libertarian answer is the person with the better connection to it. And so a piece of land uh, is a scarce resource, and the original homesteader has a better claim to that land than uh, anyone else, uh, including this single taxing agency, whether it's the community or whatever. So I, I – I don't agree with it, and I know Hoppe doesn't agree with it. I know Rothbard um, opposes it. So, are there um, any other questions? Anything I missed uh, in, the, in the scroll up here? So, there's any questions I missed? If I miss it, you can call it to my attention.
I think most of this was you're chatting among each other. I do see Jock posted Proudhon's definition of government. Let me see here. To be governed is to be watched, inspected, spied upon, and directed, law-driven, numbered, regulated, enrolled, etc. You know, I mean, this is this sort of leftist conflation of authority with uh, with tyranny uh, or with statism. And Let's see, do I have this on the wrong? Uh, I have it on all participants. Let me see if I'm not looking at everything right. Is there something I'm missing here? I have I have the chat window open. That's all I can see. I don't see something by Michael. Oh, okay. Let me let me see what the the forum question is here. Um, hold on a second. There's a Moodle Moodle forum question here, which I missed. Um, oh, I don't know how I missed this. I thought I had a subscription. Maybe it was just posted. Um, okay, this is from Eric Stabe. Uh, I'm confused by what seems to be a contradiction in Hoppus TSC this week. Let me flip back to the slide. Is this what you guys are talking about, Eric Stabe? Oh, quickly, I see John McGinnis has asked a question here. Uh, Hop uses arguments. I wonder why I'm not seeing this. Maybe he's not posting it to all. you got to send to all participants, I believe. Hop uses the argumentation theory, but uh, says needs is took comp to a new level. Will you discuss it? Yes, I will in the, in the epistemology discussion. I will discuss that probably two lectures from now. Okay, let me go back to Stave, Eric Stave's question. <clears throat> he thinks of a contradiction in TSC. In chapters 2 and 3, Hoppe speaks of how socialist economies force people to rely on family – let me cut and paste this here so everyone can see it. This is from Eric Stave. Okay. Um, Socialist economies force people to rely on family relationships and persuasion to advance their economic standing uh, rather than ingenuity and skill. Later on, page 70, he says people develop uniform and uninteresting personalities, and the state kills creativity. These statements seem to be at odds. Uh, how can a person's behavior – I'm sorry I didn't see this question before. How can a person's behavior be at once – I might need to reply to this later after thinking about it because this is sort of a little jumble. Hold on a second. How can your behavior at once reacting to the same stimulus become both more private and more political? Having to rely on interpersonal relationships to achieve advancement would seem to force people to become more personable and seek interaction with others. Um, I'm actually – I'd have to I have to look at it and see. Um, maybe someone here can… I'm having trouble concentrating on this right now. Um, does someone else here have a, a thought on what he's talking about? Socialist economies force people to rely on family. I don't know what he means to advance or I don't know. I, I'm not sure what you're talking about in the first part. <clears throat> what I'll do is I'll either address this next week or I'll try to answer in writing that everyone can see um, later this week to answer that question. I'll look at I'll look at the quotes you're talking about. See what you mean. Um, Manjula Guru says in the reading, socialism is said to be liberalism in the U.S. Can you explain this? Um, I think you mean the terminology question. Um, uh, I've never quite understood exactly how this bizarre shift happened. I mean. From my perspective, the word liberalism used to be uh, – to denote sort of a progressive, pro-individual, enlightenment sort of improvement in the human condition, free market, classical liberalism it's called now in the U.S. Um, and somehow the leftists and socialists in the U.S. co-opted that term where its meaning has been changed in the U.S. where liberalism means basically social, social democratic socialism. Um, 
where it, in Europe, I believe the word liberalism still means uh, what we call classical liberalism here. I mean, Mises had a book, Liberalismus, right, um, classical liberalism. Um, or I think in the American market they called it liberalism in the classical tradition, so people wouldn't think we're talking about Bill Clinton and, and uh, the Democratic Party. So it's just a terminology thing. It's, it's bizarre. Um, libertarianism has more than one meaning. I believe it has a philosophical meaning, having something to do with free will. Um, and of course, it's the word civil libertarian is usually a leftist sort of ACLU type term that refers to people that believe in personal liberty but not really economic liberty. So words just have different meanings. Edward Dim, do you prefer a term to refer to yourself as a non-left libertarian? Well, I actually – I mean I'm sympathetic to a lot of the insights of the left, and I'm sympathetic to the argument that a lot of our um, history came from the left tradition. Um, there's also intertwining with the right in some ways. I, I think that the left-right spectrum is a flawed way of looking at things, and I think that they are both types of socialism, and they are both wrong, and they both have more in common with each other um, than we have with either of them. And I don't think libertarianism is either left or right. And I personally, and Hoppe has the same view, I personally get a little bit um, – uh, uh, I won't say upset, but I, 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 I resist the idea, the call among left libertarians for us to learn from our origins on the left. Um, I mean I'm all for recognizing the insights of left libertarians, but as for the, the pure left itself, I think they're utterly evil. So it's right, but I think they're utterly evil and completely unlibertarian, and if anything, they have something to learn from us, okay? like economic literacy and intellectual honesty and consistency, um, uh, and the same with the right. Um, so I just think I'm a libertarian. Now, I usually say I'm an anarcho-libertarian um, or maybe an Austrian or Rothbardian libertarian. Um, I don't even like the term anarcho-capitalist myself. But again, this is about Hoppe, and Hoppe does use the term, term anarcho-capitalist. He doesn't mean he's a capitalist in the sense that's criticized by um, the left libertarian. When they criticize capitalism, they mean the existing corporatist monopoly capitalist institutions we have in place now, which of course so-called anarcho-capitalists are not in favor of either. It's just a, another semantic difference. <coughs> John McGinnis um, asks, uh, capitalism and libertarianism um, seem interchangeable synonyms, according to Hoppe. Um, I think so. I think he's going with, you know, I guess in the 60s and 70s and 80s, that uh, you know, the, the big libertarians like Milton Friedman and Rand and even Rothbard, they all, for some reason, used capitalism as a synonym or as maybe a proxy for, um, like a, a type of metonymy for. Um, for a free market order with strong private property rights and a, a thriving free market advanced economy, maybe an industrialized economy. So it had it did become that way. Um, and yeah, I think Hans does use it as more of a synonym. I uh, uh, I think Danny says Danny Sanchez from Mises Institute says some left libertarians don't like the good kind of capitalism either. I agree with him. This is my problem with their with their use of the word capitalism because if you try to corner them. Say, well, what we mean by capitalism is this, so we don't really have a disagreement. They will still disagree with you, saying, betraying that for some of them it really is substantive. For example, they um, they will say that, well, you know, um, we're against authority, libertarian authoritarianism, and you know, being bossed around, pushed around by bosses, this kind of stuff, um, which sort of buys into this Marxist leftist. View of human nature and the economy and exploitation and alienation from your labor and all these kinds of things, which I think is not – first of all, it's not part of libertarianism, and I don't think it's compatible with it. Certainly not required by it. Um, Tito Warren, how should we reply to the leftist assertion that hierarchy is bad? And they don't really answer the question. Um, how should we reply? Um, well, because it's well, first of all, it's not. I, I think it's not a clearly defined term. What is what does hierarchy even mean? I mean, libertarianism has a clear conceptual framework. When we talk about scarce resources, 
property rights, aggression. These are all really clear. We oppose aggression. We think aggression is unjustified or immoral. Now we have our reasons for this. That is our fundamental view. Um, and any kind of law that you want to set up that would prevent um, something that you think is bad, like hierarchy, um, if, if the hierarchy is not aggression, then a law against it is aggression, and we oppose that. So we have a really simple view. So if they would define what they mean by hierarchy, some types of it are wrong, like a state's hierarchy, um, or laws that impose state power, or they give power to some actors like unions, giving them the power to force businesses to negotiate in good faith with them, etc., then we oppose that because it violates property rights. Um, this is the problem with leftists, I believe, is they, they don't really think clearly. They don't have clear concepts. Um, um, so I, I mean I don't know what to say. They, if people don't want to be rational and think clearly, I don't know how to communicate with them. But I would say that you know it's obvious that some types of hierarchy, if you use a broad term, are justified. You know, natural hierarchies, um, family relationships, um, societal relationships. I mean, hierarchy just means some things are ranked higher than others in some ways. We can't be complete egalitarian. I mean, maybe give them the Wilt Chamberlain example from Nozick's Energy State in Utopia, where he says that let's say we have a completely egalitarian society where everyone's equal, but then we have freedom. And you know everyone wants to see Wilt Chamberlain play basketball because he's great, so they all voluntarily give him a quarter or a dollar or whatever. And after a while, he's going to have an unequal distribution of wealth. Yet it was done totally um, legitimately. No one's rights were violated. So the only way to stop it would be to come in and prevent people from trading voluntarily with each other. Uh, and that, but that would be a type of hierarchy. So you can see how it could arise. So it depends on the process. Um, Um, sure, you're welcome, uh, Keto. Sorry, did I miss a question? Any other questions? So I'm thinking about luck here. I don't know who brought that up, but of course that is the um, that is basically the argument of John Rawls. I don't know how many of you are familiar with him. He had a book called A Theory of Justice in seventy something, early seventies. One of the most famous political theory books of all time, and the, the book that came along with the response to it was Robert Nozick's Anarchy State Utopia, which I believe – and Hoppe – by the way, if you look at the introduction um, to the Ethics of Liberty, Murray Rothbard's Ethics of Liberty, written by Hoppe, the introduction written by Hoppe, he's got a great section in there where he just totally, com totally devastates Nozick by comparing him and his approach to Rothbard. I mean he argues that you know, Nozick was more of a – Flashy kind of guy, a razzle dazzle guy, a dilettante, uh, not not a systematic thinker, not a foundational thinker. Unlike Rothbard, who's systematic and careful and rigorous. And so it's no surprise that Nozick wrote his book and never responded to criticisms and um, recanted of his libertarianism to a degree uh, later on. Um, and actually, Anarchy State and Utopia is. Uh, an argument in defense of the state. Most people think it's an anarchist argument. It's not. It's an argument in the sense of the state, how an anarchist state could be justified. Um, but in any case, uh, John Rawls' argument that Nozick was replying to was that people are born with – some people are born um, by luck with better skills or social status than others, and that's unfair that they can benefit from that. Therefore, we can justify – Imposing a type of egalitarian leveling effect on society, um, etc. Danny asks. Um, well, let me let me continue this real quick. Uh, Jock says um, Rawls doesn't doesn't prove a rationale for having coercive mechanisms of distribution. Um, you can diagnose the same problems as the veil of ignorance, but still find voluntaristic ways of dealing with them. Um, yeah, I agree with that. Um, but I think he – I don't know if he does, but I know that his, his argument is used to justify redistribution. Uh, of course, I think it, it fails, so I agree with he doesn't actually provide a rationale. But I do think the veil of ignorance argument is very 
um, um, uh, problematic. Uh, yeah, Kathy Cuthbert is right. Uh, Harrison Bergeron is the Kurt Vonnegut story. Actually, Hoppe cites that um, that story in um, I think it's in the Theory of Socialism and Capitalism or the other book that we went over tonight. In one of his footnotes, he talks about that. It's, it's basically the state imposing egalitarianism on the people's was it looks or capacity or skill, you know, handicapping people that are better than others to make everyone equal. Okay, Danny asks. Um, in PSC, Hoppe uses the term conservative socialism, and in general, uses a negative connotation of the term, referring to people using the state to coercively conserve their place in society. In later works, he uses that term in a positive way. Uh, what explains the shift in terminology? Well, I think he's uh, in the positive sense. Um, I think he's talking about cultural conservatism. So he's talking about um, traditional culturally conservative values like the importance of natural elites and family ties and natural leaders and um, private institutions like marriage and uh, the home and uh, maybe small cultural communities that you know so, so he's using it in that sense there that he's in favor of and he's explaining there how the state undermines and erodes that, and how, in the absence of the state, these things would be more important and would supplant a lot of the institutional functions that are poorly accomplished by the state uh, now. But I think in the first usage, conservative socialism, I think he's um, um, he's referring to more like feudalism, basically, and also the, the the Republican or the conservative sort of party. Um, opposition to change and the use of the state to prevent change and to preserve people's place in society. So I, I suppose the word has uh, many meanings, like a lot of words. If he's using it one new one, one place, I don't think they contradict each other. I think it's just a little confusing because the same word is used in both. Yeah, Jock, Jock has a comment about European conservatives and uh, being identified with aristocracy and feudalism um, in sort of hopeless time. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with that. But like I said, he's got his views on monarchy. Most people you know, sneer at this and say, oh, monarchy's ridiculous. But of course, he's not in favor of monarchy. He, he uses that to criticize democracy. He's showing that the common assumption that the move from monarchy to democracy was – the common view is that that was progress. He's saying that that common view is mistaken. Uh, he's not saying it's not better in any way. He's just saying that the common view that, that was this Whiggish, unalloyed progress in society was, was not good. Uh, Jock says, uh, economically, a private state is less capital destructive. Yeah, we're going to discuss that in one of our lectures. I mean, he's he even has a, a letter to the editor to Chronicles magazine like 15, 20 years ago. Or he argues that private slavery is um, um, less economically destructive than public slavery. So, and, you know, not that he's justifying either one, but he's explaining the systematic economic effects of those. So public slavery is, you know, kind of what we have now, or what you have in, in communism. Let's say everyone's a slave of this big institution. You have um, just massive destruction and impoverishment and waste, whereas Chattel slavery in the U.S. where there was an owner of a slave, you could expect the owner of the slave to have an incentive to take care of his property. I mean it's horrible to talk about, but it's uh, – you can analyze these things in a way, and, and basically a private situation uh, or a public, a public situation tends to be worse economically than a lot of these settings than a private one would. Yeah, Gary Malta does make that point. Um, Anyway, if you look on Hoppe's website, hoppe.com, under the publications page, if you search for the word Chronicles, you'll see that letter. Um, just search for the word Chronicles. Any other questions? Edward asked about the is all problem and argumentation ethics. Uh, yeah, I'm going to go into that as much detail as I can, and we can have a, a good discussion about the whole thing. 
Uh, Kathy, I think if you look at the letter, I think he uses like communism as, as an example, uh, unless you're talking about Yuri. But if you're talking to me, um, hell, let me try to find it. It's right here, and I, I, I don't have it in front of me right now. I'll just I'll give you the link. Here it is, right here. Oh, this was a long time ago, I think, before he was um, really well known, and this is just a letter to the editor to um, to Chronicle. So I don't think he got much for that. Although his uncharitable critics could seize on that if they wanted to. Um. <clears throat> Danny says, is it true that Rothbard derived the homestead principle from self-ownership while Hoppe does the opposite, deriving self-ownership from the homestead principle, that we own ourselves because we're first users of ourselves? Um, I don't think that's quite right. I think – okay, and we'll talk about this next lecture more in the argumentation of it, but um, my perspective on it is this. I think Rothbard actually didn't derive it. Rothbard sort of states this natural case like we've done already in the first lecture here, uh, like Papa does as well. And he just takes it as sort of intuitive, illogical consistencies from not accepting it. Um, but I think he takes it as sort of a lot given that we own ourselves. Papa, I don't think he, 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 um, he says we're first users. That's his argument for property. Sorry for my poop sparking. There's something I'm looking about. Um, Papa's argument is Papa's argument is that you you own a resource if you have a better link to it, or connection to it than anyone else. In the case of owned resources, external goods, yeah, the first user has this best connection to it because it was previously unowned, and you have a better connection than anyone else. But his argument in the case – and I wrote, I wrote about this in my, argue, my article on um, uh, how we come to own ourselves, how we come to own ourselves. Uh, it's on my website. It was a means of data. Papa argues that the reason you have a better connection to your body is because you have direct control over it. Now, in a way, that's just a way of restating the locking idea that you're a self-owner if you think of ownership as, a, as an actual thing rather than a normative thing. You are the actual owner. You are the natural owner, the one who actually does control your body. So he has an example. You know, if I want to raise my arm, I can just will it and raise my arm. So obviously I have the better connection to my body. I have an intimate connection with my body. My personhood, my identity is intimately bound up with this body because I'm the one actually directly controlling it. Um, that is his argument, and um, I think it actually um, – um, is different than the homesteading argument, the first use argument. Because if you if you go with first use, then parents would own their children because the, the mother excuse me the mother owns the matter in her body that grows into the baby. And when it's born, you know, it's just coming from her body. She owns it. But Hans's view is no, the baby or the human when he reaches a certain point um, has self control and so basically he like reappropriates the body that you could say is owned by the mother at a certain point. It becomes owned by the baby or by the, by the child at a certain point. Um, so there's a shift in ownership of that physical resource from the parent to the baby because the baby has a better connection to it, not because of first use but because of direct control. Any other questions? Tito asks, are children property? Um, I don't view children as property, and I don't believe Hoppe views children as property. I think the, the, view, um, the view is that um, um, children are self-owners, but there's, a, there's like a continuum or a spectrum when they develop from um, – a state where they need care and, and, and someone to be a guardian for them. So I think the view is that a child has rights, a, a very young child has rights, um, but 
it doesn't have full capacity to to make decisions, etc. And so the presumption is that the parent who has a natural link to the child is presumed to have sort of the implicit consent of the child to be his decision maker for his interest, like a guardian, until he reaches a certain level of maturity. So the parent is a guardian. That's why I believe that the copy and rough guardian view would be that you know if a parent abuses a child, then the presumption is overcome that this human being is the one the child would – we can assume the child would appoint to be his guardian to exercise his affairs for him, and it would go to some third party who could adopt the child or rescue the child or whatever. Um, Tito says, are they stewards of the child? Yeah, I mean the, the word in the law is guardian or, or in the civil law, tutor or tutrix. Um, so yeah. Um, is there a claim to parenthood until the child reaches maturity? I think there is a claim to parenthood, but the claim is um, – there's two different claims. There's a claim of the parent with respect to the child and that relationship with respect to the outside world. With respect to the outside world, um, the outside world has to respect the child's rights and views the parent as the spokesman for the child. So. You know, the child doesn't consent to being abused by an outsider because the parent makes it clear that you're not going to do that to my child, exercising, speaking for the child. Um, but between the child and the, and, the, and the parent, I think that um, the parent doesn't own the child. The parent um, uh, has the right by its natural link to the child to be the first one to be presumed to be the spokesman for the child. Now, I personally believe that the parent has obligations to the child, positive, legally enforceable obligations, um, as I argue in that argument in that article, how we come to own ourselves. Um, I actually am not sure that Hoppe agrees with that because um, I think he is pro-abortion rights, although he hasn't written much on this. Um, but I think that my argument could be used to – to argue that at least some abortions are at least somewhat um, aggression because it violates your obligation to the rights bearing entity that you've created. But this is, you know, this course is not about my views. I mean, I'm happy to answer questions, but it's about Hoppe's views. And um, maybe we can ask Hoppe. I don't know if he's going to want to answer it uh, because he asked me a long time ago to come up with an argument justifying abortion, and um, I gave up on it. <laughs> um, how would circumcision be viewed in this regard? Um, well, look, I'll give you my, my perspective on this. Um, um, oh, well, Jaya Dixon asked about the child wanting to leave. Well, that's Rothbard's view, and I presume that Hoppe agrees with that. Yeah, when the child is mature enough to say no, basically, or I want to run away, um, then I think he um, uh, has demonstrated a certain maturity. But, I mean, I think practically social customs and Practical common sense would establish guidelines for that. I don't think it's going to be a three-year-old or a five-year-old. Uh, but in any case, um, about uh, circumcision. I mean, look, I've read all the debates about this. Um, my view is that like female circumcision would be uh, such a unnecessary and, and, and mutilating type of act that if the parent does that, you wouldn't. You would. The parent would lose their. They would lose their right to speak with the child because most people would assume that the child would not appoint such a person to be their guardian. Uh, male circumcision, I mean my personal view is even if you're against it or you wouldn't do it yourself or you think there's arguments against it, I don't think it's so heinous and so obviously wrong um, that, um, that you can't say that's not within the parent's scope of authority to decide for the child. And most people that are circumcised… That I'm aware of tend to um, be glad that they were, or don't resent it. Sort of blessing it in revert in, in, in retroactively, indicating that you know there's empirical evidence to think that you know, it's reasonable that the child would consent to the parent having the authority to make that decision for them, even if it's largely on cultural or cosmetic grounds. So that's my view. Um,
Oh, well, some of you are talking about Bloch's view on evictionism. Um, again, I'm actually – Hoppe has hardly written on abortion that I'm aware of. Like I said, I believe he's loosely in favor of it, um, which we all have to be in the sense that we, we would not want to empower the state to have that invasive power to police these types of private matters. So as a practical matter, we pretty much have to be pro-choice, legally speaking. Um, um, but I wouldn't be surprised if he if he would take a dim view of it in the later stages, like like I would. You know, whether he thinks that's a type of aggression or murder, or just immoral or unseemly, I don't know. Edward asked a question about civil law and common law. Um, you said Hoppe has mentioned the civil law is better than the common law because it's written down and less subject to arbitrary interpretation by the state. And do I have an opinion of this? Well, actually, I'm not aware of him writing that. If you could find that, I'd be curious about it because I don't think he's actually ever written that. Um, it doesn't sound like something he would say. It, well, if you can find that, I'd be really curious. I don't recall anything like that. Now, I wrote a long article on the civil law in 1995. For the JLS, when he was the editor, he published it, so maybe he was getting something from that. Um, I'm from Louisiana, which is a civil law jurisdiction, and I have written a good deal on it, and I do um, uh, I do think that the civil law is superior to the common law, but not because it's written down, but just because it comes from the Roman system, which has better legal – cleaner legal concepts than the common law system. Um, both the common law and the civil law are basically written down now. I don't think that – I don't think, and I don't think Hans would think that being written down is really su a superior aspect to it. Now, that is the view of some legal positivist types, um, but if you find that, I'd be happy to look at it. I'm actually curious. So uh, if he actually thinks civil law is superior than common law in some ways, um, this is news to me. But it could be for the same reasons I do. I think it's just better because it's a more scientific, more rational foundation for law. Yeah, please let me know. Yeah, exactly. Kathy says the Constitution is written, and where did that get us? And I know Hoppe is just disgusted with the U.S. Constitution and views it as a mistake. Um, so I don't think he would fixate on the written aspect of it. And again, like I say, the common law is written down now. Cases are cases are published in written form. And there are, there are treatises that summarize and you know, um, systematize and categorize it in a written form, so I don't think that's the thing. Yeah, Jock talks about how the origins are about monopolies, being the common law across the land. Yeah, of course there's elements of that in the civil law as well. Uh, in Roman law, there was one law – ah, now I'm forgetting the term. There was one law for the Roman citizens and one law for the outsiders. Um, there's actually a Latin or some kind of term for that. Um, use gentium, I think. Use gentium. Uh, use gentium. Some other a term for the other. Anyway, um, but actually this helped to develop um, a common law that was wasn't like the monopoly of the king's law. It, it, it helped it helped the Roman law develop the magnificent body of legal rules um, that it has developed into. But maybe someone can Wikipedia that term and make sure I'm thinking of it right. But I think it was used in the uh, – anyway, if anyone's curious, I'll try to find it and talk about it next class. Well, we're almost 30 minutes over. I don't mind going over, but I know some people are very late, and people listening to the lectures later uh, are going to get annoyed if we go too long because um, they don't have any predictability. Um, so I'd be happy to answer a couple more questions, but I think we should cut it off soon or by by the hour. The latest. Any other questions? Okay, it's getting late for everyone, so thank you guys. I enjoyed it. Good questions, and we will pick this up with argumentation, ethics, and rights uh, next week. Thank you all much.